such a brilliant programme this year. I'm absolutely delighted to be here on stage with these fantastic people. We've had a few meetings in the run-up to this session and uh, I'm really excited to hear what they're going to be talking about. Uh, we have Megan Whelan. She is the Chief Content Officer for Radio New Zealand. Thank you. We have Priya Prabhakaran, Director of Astro Audio has only been in the position for a couple of weeks, she was telling me yesterday as well. So, uh, yeah, and we also have Thomas Geiger, the branding and consultant partner for Pure Jingles. So how this, <laughs> how this session's going to happen is uh, there's a couple of presentations, uh, there's a few questions that we're going to ask as well, um, but we really are excited to invite questions from you guys as well. So please, at the end, there will be enough uh, time for questions. As long as you don't go on too much, Thomas. <laughs> We've seen how many slides are in your deck. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, so, so please make notes and you'll be able to ask questions at the end. Thanks very much. Um, Megan, take it away, please. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, kia ora. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Kō Megan Wilanaho. Hello, everyone. I am Megan Whelan. I'm the Chief Content Officer, as Rosa said, at RNZ. RNZ is Aotearoa's uh, commercial free public broadcaster. The commercial free public broadcaster bit is probably important in this room because what I'm going to talk about uh, comes with the tremendous privilege of not having to monetize everything we do, but I think most of it um, is still relevant to everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how RNZ has moved from being a very traditional public broadcaster, um, public radio, linear radio organisation to being the probably the most distributed brand in New Zealand, media brand in New Zealand. So we have uh, two main radio stations that broadcast in New Zealand, one that broadcasts uh, to the wider Pacific region, uh, obviously a website, an app, multiple social media channels, and we do something that's very rare in the world. We freely share all of our content. So we have more than 60 content sharing agreements uh, from all of the commercial media within New Zealand who take our news and current affairs content to um, uh, who else are we on? Air New Zealand, the, the national carrier, takes all our podcasts and they pay us a tiny tiny amount. Um, uh, we share with yeah, all the big news organisations, most of the radio stations, one of the big commercial radio networks takes our news bulletins and plays our news bulletins. So through that strategy, we reach about 80% of the country monthly and about 2% of that uh, through our own data is just on one of our radio stations. So most people are meeting us on multiple platforms. So I want to talk about what the kind of high level what you're thinking about when you're thinking about a brand. We don't think about it in terms of the logo, although I'm going to talk a little bit about the logo. We think about it in terms of what is the promise we are making to the audience. And there's quite a nice follow-on from the talk just before lunch. The promise you are making to the audience is different depending where you are. So we've set a goal of reaching 80% of New Zealanders. That means we need to be in the places where we are. And the promise that we make when they are listening to RNZ National, which is our talk program, when they are listening to RNZ Concert, which is our fine music program, um, or when they're reaching us on Instagram and TikTok is different because they are different audiences and we need to understand who they are and what it is. But the overall vision for everything we do is outstanding public media that matters. So when I'm in meetings with my team and they're pitching me a piece of content, the two questions I ask them, actually there's three, but the two big questions are, what is outstanding about it and why does it matter? And then the next question is, to whom does it matter? Um, because it might not matter to me, but it might matter to a 20-year-old in Gore right down the bottom of the country who is living a very different life to me. I've been at RNZ for 20 years. When I first started, we were just a radio station, or just two radio, three radio stations. Um, there used to be a sign in every single studio that said, never talk over the bird. Don't talk over the bird. Talking over the bird was the worst possible thing you could do. The bird plays every day at six, just before seven, just before the seven o'clock news. It's been going for 50 years. We now have uh, recordings of about 200 bird, native birds in New Zealand. It sounds like this, hopefully. Nope, that did not play. I'll go back one, see if I can make it play. I hit play, right? Play. The Korimako, the bellbird. Imagine 
how lovely it is waking up, easing into your day, hearing that. Unless you happen to be like me and absolutely terrified of birds. Um, <laughs> that one is the Korimako, the New Zealand bellbird. I actually have it tattooed on my shoulder, which is why I chose that particular piece. But as we've evolved, the bird has changed. So people now do talk over the bird. Um, but it also has become a huge part of our brand. New Zealanders love birds. We, we, we think very closely about our birds. Um, so it's become part of our podcast branding. If we can play that one. He nai purangi tēnei, nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. So that is, goes into every, so at the beginning of every single one of our podcasts, that was Te Reo Māori. Um, uh, this is a podcast from Te Reo Irirangi o Aotearoa, Radio New Zealand. Um, incidentally, this branding, which I'm going to come back to, those little, I guess, brackets, headphones, little curly things, um, I'll come back to that in a minute. This is our new podcast page. I'm very glad to say we launched it literally last night. I put it into the slideshow hoping that we would actually get it up before I uh, did this presentation, otherwise you were getting a very sneak peek. Um, but yes, if you go to rnz.co.nz slash podcasts, uh, you'll get to see that. Um, and it's very new and very shiny and we like it a lot. So, as our brand has evolved, we have... Oh, let's get past that. Uh, we've taken it even further. Hopefully we can play this one. There's a lot to discuss in the mornings. Get all the news with Morning Report on RNZ National. So that's the Tui, absolutely a um, famous New Zealand bird. Uh, that was an ad that played on TV um, and also uh, on lots of our YouTube videos. Um, so we take that brand. The idea is that RNZ is reliable, we're trusted, we're the most trusted media organisation in the country, we are there when you need us, um, we are the lifeline utility, um, if you saw June's presentation talking about the uh, floods in Gisborne, you know, we are responsible for getting emergency information to people. So I love the idea of taking the bird across all those platforms because it shows that reliability and that consistency and who we are and what we do. Back when I first started, many, many moons ago, we kind of looked like this. Um, and as our brand has evolved, as the, the design of our brand has evolved, we've taken that tohu, that symbol, which is the koru, which is quite a famous symbol in, in New Zealand culture, um, and particularly in Te Ao Māori, and iterated it in a lot of different places. So if you look at our website, if you look at our socials, if you look at any of the ways that you touch RNZ content, that little piece of symbolism is there um, throughout everything that we do. Um, and again, it's that idea of we are reliable, we're consistent, you can come to us to get what you know that you need, in particular news and current affairs content. We'll come back to that later. Um, but part of this design is also about New Zealand is a diverse country, it's becoming more and more diverse. We wanted to show uh, that there's lots of different ways that New Zealand RNZ might be able to serve you, even if you are not a traditional radio um, linear listener. Um, and that branding sits across all of our kind of social channels. This is most of our Instagram designs, for example, so taking that content and putting it onto those platforms. And my last little bit is, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the thing I'm thinking about at the moment, and if you have feedback for me, I would love to hear it. Um, so this is what we're traditionally known for. We're a news and current affairs broadcaster. We do news, we're very good at it. It's in our muscle memory. We know how to do it. Um, you know, we do politics, we do protests, we do stories about climate change and about huge big infrastructure things and national emergencies. But in the last few years, we have started to evolve into more lifestyle content. Um, so we are making things about music and about entertainment and about breakdancing and about food and wellness and culture and health. And that's something we've always done on air. Um, on the radio platforms, we've always done it. The radio platforms drive a lot of the content that we're putting on those social platforms, but we're also now making just like content specifically for digital platforms. And our branding's got a bit confused because of that. So if you're on our Instagram channel, for example, you're getting all of this. You're getting, you know, the Prime Minister's resigned alongside, uh, there's a natural disaster happening up north, alongside, here is a nice gelato recipe. And I'm looking for research at the moment. I've asked our research people to do some research about whether or not that's actually what our audience wants. Do they want those things sitting alongside each other or do they want them separately? And so we're considering creating a new brand, which is RNZ Life. 
um, we'll build a page for it on the, on the site, it'll take into account all of these things, we'll brand it on air as RNZ Life, and our social channels will change to, to iterate this. I still haven't decided if this is the right thing to do, but what I'm thinking about as I think about um, these questions is always going back to that, what's the promise I'm making that audience? So if I'm making the audience a promise that they will get great recipes and interesting movie reviews and um, profiles of people doing cool stuff, is that the promise? Is that what they're after? Um, and can I keep doing it? So it's all very well and good to write one really cool recipe and uh, have someone make a, a, you know, an Instagram food video, but if I can't do that consistently every week, I'm gonna lose audience really fast um, and they're not gonna wanna come back to me for what they think I failed to deliver them. Can I do it? Can I keep it up? Can I constantly do more of that? And then lastly, in a market that's incredibly crowded, we have uh, the most radio stations per capita in the world, um, and you know, as the audience fragments across all of the different digital platforms, what am I doing that's standing out? What can RNZ do that is different to what all the other New Zealand broadcasters and, in fact, international broadcasters are doing? So that's what I'm thinking about. If you have feedback about whether or not I should make an RNZ Life Instagram account, um, I would love to hear it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Um, Priya, we're going to ask a few questions now. So, um, you've just been in the job for two weeks. No, 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 no. Okay, so I've been in the job for a few months. Right, okay. But uh, before this, I was in the acting role. Right. So, I, I really got to work earlier. Um, <laughs> and then, I mean, look, I've been with the company for a good seven years. And I started managing a station. So, I was managing hits at that point, And then I took over a network. I handled the English network. And then slowly moved on to head of content and now director. So I think in terms of strategy and brands, um, I put the groundwork quite early. Yes. Uh, now it's more like I'm in charge. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's terrifying, right? you. terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody pr prepared me for any of this, but yeah. But you're, uh, when we were talking, you were really passionate about how you're doing things differently. So tell me a bit about that. So I think, similar to what Megan said, right? I mean, at the end of the day, the goal that we're trying to do is unlearned radio. Um, it's, look, Astro is a, a big brand. It's been around for 28 years. Um, and we've done it very well. It's a very weld oil machine. But sometimes it makes us too rigid. And so what we have tried to do now is really start doing things differently, it's not radio. Um, and we, we have tried it with most of our content and then the way even we, we schedule our commercials, we don't do block programming anymore. Um, in terms of, it's, we don't call them radio stations anymore, we call them brands because are they available on air, online or on ground? Right? So for, I'll give you an example with ERA. ERA is the number one station in Malaysia with 4.5 million weekly listeners, but on Instagram, they have the biggest reach at 4.1 million followers. Uh, on TikTok, they have 1.5 million followers. And on Facebook, it's a whole different ballgame. So the thing is, you're all attracting different audience. And it's the same with, with hits and stuff like that. Um, we, we don't just think on air because the content that we do on air might not resonate with someone who is just scrolling all the time. Mm. So that is one of the things that, that we've kind of done differently. And also, I think when you're thinking uh, holistically about brands as well, it, uh, those uh, likes and follows, uh, they're, they're, they're nice to have as well, aren't they? Yeah. You know, they're, they're a mu much more kind of immediate and tangible than, than a lot of listening figure kind of radio. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, listening figures that we're used to. So it's, it is a, you know, it's kind of an indication, I suppose, a lot of people use it as an indication of if you're kind of going down the right path. Yes. Don't they? Yeah. yeah, because you know, sometimes you spend so much of time working on a campaign or some sort of content and you think it's great because we're all in our radio bubble, mm. right? We're like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm like, who said? <laughs> who yeah. said it's yeah. a good idea? <laughs> and then when you put it up online, and then you'll see you only have like 10 likes, and I'm like, clearly yeah. we wasted all this time and energy and effort just for 10 likes, Yeah. you know? And I think when we first started with digital, so we would put out five, six videos a day, and you will only get 10, 20 likes. And I'm like, that's a lot of work that mm. we're doing just for that. And now when we just take a phone and then just walk around and that organic content and that raw footage seems to be getting a lot more views. Mm. I'll give you an example. One of our announcers wanted to uh, apply for leave 
And he tried doing that on air, just calling the boss. You know, there's, it's always that gimmick, right? So what he ended up doing was buying a billboard right smack in, in the Kuala Lumpur city center. And that went viral. Nobody knows why <laughs> that went viral. He took the boss there and he said, you know what, I need a big gesture, that's, that's it. And that, that engagement just kind of spilled over and now that boss is a popular guy. Right. Right? So Cause, even cause if... he said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <it is. laughs> right? So it's, it's things like this that we really just have to get out of our radio bubble. And I think a lot of times we've got to honour the reality of things. I think in the past we would have probably said, uh, we know what the listeners want. Listeners want prank calls. Do they really though? Mm -hmm. Is that something that is still relevant? So... Uh, Astro has finally removed, after 15 years, Astro has no more prank calls. As, uh, the last one was removed, I think, a month ago with our Chinese stations because we realised it doesn't serve that purpose anymore. Mm. You know, and honouring the reality of things. Even a few weeks ago, I think, if the Malaysians here would know, uh, we lost uh, some of our announcers to a competitor and it was very sudden. It was immediate that that whole change just happened in 24 hours. But we had to address it to our listeners. Right? Because we cannot just pretend this person has not work, doesn't work here anymore. It's been 20 years. To just suddenly stop saying his name or you know, like pretend he doesn't exist, it's going to be difficult. So what we did, just like a breakup, we went on air, we said, yes, you would have heard, you would hear him somewhere else, but thank you for your service, thank you for your 20 years, but guess what? He's left, so we've got more money. So we're doing a campaign called We're Giving Away His Salary on Air. <laughs> which we did. We gave away, anybody calls us, you just tell us, we don't even have to tell, answer a question, you just say, hi, I'm listening to hits, cool, here's a thousand ringgit. And we gave away, <laughs> so we did an every caller win uh, on Friday, where every caller won a thousand ringgit from 6 to 10 a.m. And then that response was overwhelming, so we decided to ex give more money, so we extended it for the entire month, every day. Wow. Just tune in, uh, or just check out for the clues on, on digital and then let us know and then we'll give it away. But that takes like multi-strategy management because if you have got one program controller, I, I'm guessing that they were like, oh my goodness, we've lost one of our stars. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Like, so how then it's people management. It's the people that are then coming up with the idea rather than getting bogged down with Correct. the kind of, how am I going to solve my problem? Correct. It's how am I going to make this into part of our brand. Not going to lie, look, when it first happened, it was a shock. <laughs> and I told everybody, look, take this day to process this. Mm. We will regroup tomorrow and then we'll figure out a game plan. So, look, all the managers are here. I've got Navin from Hits. I've got Aza from ERA. I've got Boon from Mai. They're all here. If you want to talk to them, it's their ideas. I'm just their cheerleader and I'm the one that signs the, the paychecks and tell them whether it's going on the right track or not. Uh, but I think, you know, it's really about just doing ideas that we've never thought of. Yeah. Um, and also just because we are listeners at the end of the day, right? So we need to tell ourselves, is this something that would actually be interesting or not? I'll give you another example. Um, two, last year, two of the biggest telcos in Malaysia merged. And they came to us and said, hey, uh, we want to do you know, your usual giveaways and, and, and all that. And I, and I told them, I said, why don't we try something never been done before? And you just have to tell me whether you want to go with this. And what we said is, since two telcos are merging, why don't we merge with another radio station just for one day for this launch? And they're here today. Surya is here. And they're not part of our network. And we call them. I called DJ Lin and I said, do you want to do this? Her first reaction is, are you sure? <laughs> because nobody would ever expect this, mm. right? You would never in a million years think, I'm going to give my ad money to an, a competitor. But I think this is really what we need to do, is work together to keep this industry and this revenue in our industry. Because the competition is really out there. Mm. It's digital mm. and everybody else. So as much as we, we want to you know, try and take a slice of this pie, working together gets us more money in the end. Mm. I want to hear from these guys to tell me, tell us, how, what, what was it like responding to that phone call? And then what happened? There's Lynn is there. Where are you? <laughs> can you put your hand up? Can you can we get a microphone? Can you just quickly I know this is off plan, but you know, hey, it's live. <laughs> we're, we're good live. Like we're yeah, radio. That's, that's right. Live. It's alive and it's live. Yeah. So tell me Lynn. what were you shocked? Were you were you shocked by the by the phone call? Was it like 
Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> My name is DJ Lin. I'm from Surya FM radio station. Um, yes, um, as what uh, uh, Priya just mentioned, uh, um, we are in Surya FM, we are very proud to be part of uh, the project. Okay, And I think uh, this collaboration is the first time ever in Malaysia radio industry. Yeah, So I think it's a very a good uh, start for us yeah, to uh, collaborate and to cooperate more after this in future. Yeah, um, I think it's benefit both parties. Yeah, we, we, yeah. We, it was very interesting because what we did was we ended up putting six announcers, six breakfast announcers on air with one feed. So if you <gasps> tuned into Surya, you turned into Era, you'll be listening to the same thing. And we, we ended up streaming it live on TikTok on both accounts. Yeah. Uh, and everybody was just confused. I mean, look, obviously some people will be like, no, I only tune into this station because I want to hear this station. Yeah, yeah. So, but again, it was but for that's good, good a shot. As yeah, well. and everybody mm. started talking about it. Even media that usually don't talk about us mm. ended up talking about us. Right. And that is really what we wanted, talkability. And just making radio fun and engaging again. <laughs> And so in the future, more, more of that. More, more we, we have, I mean, look, we've got a whole lot of ideas we can actually discuss <laughs> after this. Um, but it's even this morning, we, Malaysia just won our first gold at the Paralympics. Uh, we ended up giving away gold coins on air. Um, and we called some clients immediately and they gave, us, gave the guy, gave our athlete a holiday. So as soon as he returns, he will get a holiday. So all this happened this morning before the conference started. Right. So, Things are moving at a faster speed, um, but it keeps things exciting for all of us. Mm, mm. Yeah. This reminds me, and it might remind you guys as well, of a local radio a long time ago when you had a lot of influence in your like, local market and now it's kind of national, global kind of... Would you say that's it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's sounding great. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think look, even if you looked at... Um, I, I don't know if y'all were here for, for GFK when they presented, and especially with the Malaysian media, the younger audience seemed to be missing, right? So it's something down the line that we also have realized, you know, and that's when I realized, look, for example, when I was a teenager, if my mother told me to do something, I was just not going to do it. So if you're going to force someone to keep listening to radio, they're just not going to listen. So last week I went for a concert, and the average age of everybody there was probably 11. Um, and I was just sitting down there, and I asked them the first question, do you listen to radio? And this girl looked at me and said, oh, I have it in my room, just for aesthetics. Um, I said, okay, but you turn it on, <laughs> you know? She said, uh, no, I don't. But I do listen to radio. Um, I know that you guys are giving away tickets on air. Right. Right? Because she follows on socials. So I'm not going to force you to listen. I focus on my millennials who also can spend money, uh, but also at the same time, they grew up with radio. And they can have some sort of an influence with their kids in the car while you're driving. Uh, but also at the same time, again, like a teenager, I'm just not going to force you. Yeah. Do what you need to do. Know where to go if you want the best content or the the content, uh, the concert tickets, money can't buy experience. You know where to get them. It's only on radio. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, and we're gonna ask Thomas now. Uh, you're gonna, you need the clicker. Is that right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Brilliant. Thanks. My 56 slides. Welcome. To, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Cool. So I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, that was a long flight, but I'm super happy to be here with with you all and share these amazing radio days. It's absolutely magnificent. Um, in the Netherlands, actually, uh, 10 radio stations, 10 national radio stations came together um, for the greater good. Um, uh, when uh, Russia, Russia, Ukraine happened, they did a, like a fundraiser and 10 national stations um, were networking for one day and doing a fundraiser. And they raised, I think, together with some TV stations along the lines of 135 million euros wow. over the course of one day. Okay. So talk about like the power of when we work all together for a mm. common cause. I think mm. that's, uh, that's super powerful. Yeah. Also in the Netherlands, we have a radio personality who just moved from one station to the other. He gets paid 1 million euros per year as a salary. So imagine if he moves on to yet another station. <laughs> a lot of giveaways. What a promotion <laughs> you then have, right? That's, that's pretty insane, right? Hard to imagine. So powerful ways of uh, marketing our, our stations. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to use audio branding as a marketing multiplier. It sounds a little bit theoretical. It's not that difficult. 
There's basically two ways of marketing that we can use on radio. One we do very often, that's brand marketing. For example, your logo on a billboard, along with your morning show personality, for example, along the freeway, that's an example of brand marketing. What we don't do a lot in radio is so-called performance marketing that comes from the online world. Performance marketing is very much based on one-to-one -one communication where you target a very specific listener, not just a very broad demographic, but a very specific profile, the persons you want to reach, with a very targeted and narrowly focused campaign. That's called performance marketing. And the idea of today's talk is that you can use brand and performance marketing to reinforce each other. Um, because of time constraints, I'm not going to go into the in-depth uh, about the, the nitty-gritty. How many of you actually are here tomorrow as well, all of Wednesday? Okay, quite a lot of people. If you're here at 1.30, you're more than welcome in my workshop, where I'm going to really take a deep dive into all of this. Um, today, I'm going to give you the executive summary, if you will. So, why this talk? Well, the next 10 years in radio, we all know it, there's a lot of change coming. We're living in the age of AI, of digital, of audiences moving other, to other platforms, and especially also advertisers going there as well. So, we have to be innovative and think where we're going to go. There's a couple of directions we can go. The most important choice we have to make, I feel, is are we going to continue to do what we always do, uh, always did, or are we going to go a new path, try new ways of exploring new things? That's important because research has been showing, and these are data from Europe, that this girl, let's call her Linda, says that in three years from now, she's not going to listen to the radio anymore. And this is not like a 16-year-old, this is like, I don't know, 24-year-old. And data shows that 41% of young people moves away from radio within a short amount of time. At the same time, we know that ad budgets are going to digital as well. Worldwide share of ad spends, of all the money that goes into advertising, 70% of that already goes to digital. About 5% goes to radio on a worldwide average, right? And the trend is probably going to go towards more digital. We all know that. At the same time, 90% of all listeners, and this is based on a re recent study as well, is totally fed up with commercial breaks on our radio stations. And yet, many of our radio stations, I worked in radio myself for almost 15 years, we played 12 minutes of commercials an hour. That's one-fifth of the airtime. We still do that in radio, right? Um, and especially if the ads are not relevant for the audience, it's a form of spray and pray. Many commercials we play on FM or AM are not targeted towards the entire audience, just a segment for all the others, it's not really relevant. So that's a huge uh, tune-out factor, as we all know, right? So those are the challenges. Still, I believe that radio has a very bright future. I believe there is sun behind the clouds, or even sun above the clouds. Let's be positive. And especially if we try to go new ways, explore new directions, I'm absolutely 100% confident that there's huge opportunity to thrive for all of us also in the next 10 years. How do we do that? Be relevant. If I would like you to remember anything from, from my talk today, it's relevancy for your audience, but also for your advertiser. That's how you make more revenue. Um, one way you can do that is so-called smart activation. Uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail to drive people from, for example, your social media or your radio station towards digital platforms. Why is that? Because on digital you can exactly measure things, uh, target things, and then remarket. You want to drive most traffic, not just to external uh, social media, for example, but especially to your own platforms, like your own website or your own mobile app. Reason for that is very simple. On your own platforms, you can build your own database of user data, user profiles, that you can then use to create a personalized experience for your listener, but also for your sponsors. You want to do, for example, things like recommended content. If you know the profile of your listeners, because you have their user data, for example, what they like in your station app, you can then recommend relevant content for them and keep them in your brand universe, if that makes sense. And you can also create targeted campaigns with your advertisers to have much more relevant messages 
that tailor to the interest pattern of your listeners. And therefore, the advertiser gets much more return on investment and will stay on and, and sign up for more campaigns. So try and remember, as an inspiration, com combine brand marketing and performance marketing for your radio station. So I'm with Pure Jingles. What we do is we connect your brands to your audiences through sonic branding, like jingle packages, audio branding, merging brands and performance marketing in one strategy. We do that with brands all over the world, including many here in uh, Asian Pacific. And I want to talk briefly about how audio branding actually amplifies your branding and marketing strategy, how it multiplies your marketing effects, and how it benefits your ratings and also your revenue. What comes to mind when you hear this? You recognize this? Jaws. Yeah? The famous Steven Spielberg movie, exactly, that's the one. So just two notes, imagine that, just two piano chords creates an association in your mind or a feeling, or if you know the movie, you, you see the whole movie in front of you, right? That's because audio is so powerful. Research also shows that. Um, radio and audio is so powerful because it does something to the brain. Neuroscience shows that the human brain is processing sounds much faster than it does any visual impression. So sound paints a picture, it evokes emotion, and it also creates what we call in marketing anchors, so people remember you for things. So if you have unique audio cues, like a very recognizable sonic logo, for example, for your radio station, in a jingle, for example, it creates what we call a brand recall, also brand awareness and memorability of the brand. Super powerful, of course, also for your ratings. When people ask you, uh, or ask a listener, what station have you heard yesterday? If the logo and the station name, therefore, is, is top of mind, chances are that they will mention you above a competitor, even if they listen sometimes, or even more often, to a competing station who has less powerful audio branding. So audio makes a visual message also even eight times as effective versus a video, for example, that has no audio branding we've seen in research. So it goes to show that audio is very powerful to create a strong brand for your radio station. And it's important to create an omnipresent brand on every medium, platform, and device, everywhere your audience is. That is not just on a radio station, of course. So if you think in your audience as not just a very broad demographic, like say 20 to 49 year olds, but as let's say Linda, who's 34, a very specific persona, and Linda is you know, having specific interests, maybe she listens to one or more uh, favorite radio stations, she goes to one or more favorite social media and visits her favorite events at the weekend. Those are all, call all called audience touch points. And if you know the touch points of your audience, not just um, on the air, but also online and on the ground, you can reach these people with the right message at the right time. So that makes your marketing, your branding strategy much more uh, powerful as a radio station. So it allows you to create a strong brand everywhere your audience is and therefore multiply your marketing and, and, and your ratings and therefore also your sales or your revenue. It's super powerful. To do that effectively, you want to create a so-called digital ecosystem around your radio station. So there's a couple of components. There's radio, obviously, that's still our core business, right? Social media are a great aggregator to drive people towards your radio station, but also to your app or your website, so your internal platforms. And you want to drive um, listeners also to your app or website with what we call smart activations. I spoke about that in the beginning, yes? An example of a smart activation is if you run an exclusive contest, for example, that you announce on the air, I don't know, win, um, win a dream vacation to Hawaii for two persons, when you can only participate if you download the app and install it. That's an example of smart activation, because you can then build your database of first-party data. We're going to move towards a cookie-less future, as we all know, so it's super important to build your own buckets of data that you own as a radio station, not Facebook, not Google, etc. 
know you. So you want to gather people's email addresses, but also their preferences and their data when they use your app. Then you can do all kinds of cool stuff. This I'm going to cover tomorrow because of the time. I want to respect everyone's time. Um, when we connect a brand to the audience, it's important to perhaps think in three steps. Think about your strategy, but also your creation and then the activation phase. Strategy is all about research, where we deep dive into a brand. We look at the audience. We also look at the station, of course, um, but also at the competition of the station to be able to set the station apart. Um, you spoke about this, right, Megan? You want to be different. And um, it's not always easy with today's budget to be better than anyone, especially if you, if you have a very financially strong competitor in the market, but you can be good by being different, making a difference. Then it's time for creation of uh, audio branding assets for all touch points, not just for radio, but also, for example, for online. And you want to activate the audience um, by um, you know, using certain strategies that amplify your marketing and your branding strategy. An example of this is Studio Brussels. This is an alternative radio station in Belgium. It's owned by the public broadcaster there, and it's a very young, vibrant, progressive radio station for which we love to work. Um, when we created their strategy, we looked at the market. So first of all, we mapped the market in Belgium. All the stations out there, and these are the client stations, so they have a main brand and a sub-brand. Together, they have a 10% share. Then we looked at the competition in terms of like, what are the P2 stations, the preference one stations for the listeners who have uh, Studio Brussels as P1? Uh, that's potential competition. We looked at those, and especially how they sound, how they are um, positioning themselves, and also how their acoustic imaging is, is working. And then we defined a strategy of how we can set them apart acoustically. That led to a jingle package that sounds like this. <laughs> Pretty wild and crazy, right? And we did this because all the other stations in the market had like traditional song jingles, very safe sounds. And, and as I mentioned, this is like an alternative, young, vibrant radio station. So we felt and the client felt this would fit them really well. Now, we talked about activation. So how can you use audio branding to activate your audience with a call to action? So take a specific action that you want them to take using audio branding. Well, usually, for example, an Instagram post for Studio Brussels would look like this. Ik moet het aan de man zelf vragen. Goedemorgen, Jos Klein. Goedemorgen. <laughs> Ik ben net net wakker, maar voor jullie doe alles. Right? Nothing wrong with it. But what if you do this? The hype is real, and I moet het aan de man zelf vragen. Goedemorgen, Jos Klein. Goedemorgen. <laughs> Ik ben net net wakker, maar voor jullie doe alles. Funny guy. So just using audio branding to connect your brand to the content and therefore you're getting the credits and you're more top of mind with every cool piece of content you're putting out and putting a lot of time and effort into. Same thing, same social media post. Uh, it would normally just be like this at the ending. Just dry audio. In a video, but what if you do this? Branding your station. So, and you cannot just brand your station like, uh, like in this case, but also uh, include a call to action. For example, have something like if you want more free stuff, go to our website or download our free app to win a exclusive trip to go this, to see this artist live in concert in New York, for example, right? Download the app for that. That's an example of audience activation and particularly smart activation. Remember that, smart activation that converts your audience. So a couple of takeaways before we go into discussion. 
Um, you want to reach your audience on all touch points, not just radio, that's obvious. Um, audio benefits your brand recognition, your attribution, so that people assign the content to your brand, super important for images. Brand memorability, you want to be top of mind. Investing in audio branding helps you with audience conversion. You want to connect your brand to your audience during the entire listener journey. I'm going to talk about that more tomorrow. Uh, leverage your audio on every touch point uh, because, again, it makes video up to eight times as effective in terms of you know, stickiness of the message and, and memorability of the brand. You want to monetize your audience on every touch point, um, important in this time. Therefore, build, utilize, and uh, monetize your digital ecosystem, again, because your data are your gold. Remember that, if you will, data are gold. Collect user data via smart activations, as we talked about. Therefore, you can provide personalized content for your listeners and personalized advertising, much more relevant advertising, therefore much more converting advertisements for your sponsors. So there's a free brand audit you can do, um, a free tool with 40 quick questions that gives you an impression of how your brand is performing today. Simply scan this QR code right there. It takes you to a questionnaire where you can fully, free, and without any obligations, get an impression of how your brand is doing right now. Tomorrow at 1.30 p.m., we're going to deep dive into all of this and much more with much more cases, much more audio, uh, not just me as a talking head, but especially a lot of inspiration. And um, yeah, that's it for me. If you want to get inspired, there's three quick links here. And uh, I'm happy to have a talk with you also after the event. Thanks very much. Well. Thank you. I can, uh, I can feel everyone's written like huge to-do lists to take back to your places of work. Um, but let's get some questions now so you can get even more things to do when you get back. Who wants to be first? Hand up. No one? Don't be shy. Okay, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a question actually about the idea behind free content that you give out. <laughs> Sure. That's really opposite, isn't mm. it? That's opposite to your natural... Absolutely. Natural. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, RNZ reached 15% of the country um, across uh, the two, the two um, three radio networks, but most importantly, the two national ones. Um, and... We didn't have a website. We've, we've since, you know, had a website. Our digital growth has been quite remarkable in, the, in that time. But... <sighs> Currently, so we've always had the content sharing. We started with one newspaper or one, um, I guess, uh, publisher who has several newspapers, um, and we saw that it had benefit. So our brand recognition was quite bad because, you know, 15% of people are coming to us, they listen to us, but they're not seeing us anywhere else. And so through that process, it's it's um, sort of improved the audience on our own platforms and people are much more aware of us. Um, it is completely counterintuitive. We recognise that it certainly wouldn't work for everyone. Um, we don't have to monetize our content. So, you know, yeah. we, we are pu publicly funded. We're not allowed to monetize most of our content, certainly not on our own platforms. So we have the thing. Also, New Zealand's a really small market. We're five million people, you know, and... Um, the media in New Zealand is in is in trouble. It's it's um, it's tough at the moment. We've had one radio, well, one television network that's um, pulled out of New Zealand recently, and so part of our feeling is that as public media, we have a responsibility to the media industry in New Zealand to help support the rest of the country. So it's you know part of that sort of like quite fundamental part of public media as a cornerstone of democracy. Um, we think we have a responsibility to do that and to have responsibility for that sort of shared news and current affairs. Um, so the more we can do to do that, I think the, the better off we are as a country. Um, but also, yeah, it, you can see from our numbers, it's absolutely worked. So when we look at our data, when we look at, we do a, a piece of research every year um, that looks at where people are accessing our content, about 30% is on other platforms is on content sharing, right. some social and some content sharing. So, um, But that's people recognising that it's RNZ content on those other platforms. Mm -hmm. So probably there's a whole bunch more people who are sort of not seeing, because not every publisher is great at making sure yeah. the logo's there <laughs> or the link back is there. Um, but yeah, it's so it feels counterintuitive, but it has really worked. Brilliant. Yeah. 
Yeah, it sounds like it has. Um, if anyone has, if no one has, yeah, brilliant, okay. Because obviously I have loads of questions, but I uh, <laughs> want to hear from you. Thank you so much. It was a very, very, um, what should I say, enlightening presentation by all of you. Priya, uh, here's a question for you because, uh, you know, we're, I completely buy the point that we've got to be experimentative and we've got to toy with new ideas and uh, because the listener is the king and we would design all our programming according to that. But having said that, we're talking about two different medium. One is radio, the other one is digital. Both have their own strengths and weaknesses. For me, I think radio's one of the biggest strengths is, and solace, is that it's, it ensures confidentiality. It ensures anonymity, while digital is all about being seen. Now, merging the content uh, for both the media alike, do you think that's always going to work? Or besides unlearning radio, we also need to go back to the basics of radio? So I agree. I think like you know, most of the content, some of it won't actually fit on a digital space. Um, and actually one of the things that we have actually realized since the pandemic in Malaysia is song requests has made a comeback. Um, we get a lot of people now calling in with, with, you know, I want to dedicate this song and it can be out of our usual formats and all that. And that works. Um, and, and, and you're right, I think we, we unlearning it to a certain extent in terms of just the ideas and all that would be great, but the fundamentals still remain because why do we listen to radio? And, and this is the other thing that happened also during the pandemic. It's about the vulnerability uh, of the announcers uh, that came on air, right? So everybody was stuck at home, you had nothing to do, but you could tune into the radio and somebody is there listening to you. We even did a, a full day of you call in and you talk to us, but we won't air this call. Uh, because you don't have anybody to talk to. Um, and that is that human aspect of things. So the basics of radio is still there, song requests. and, and um, But a lot of times what we do is using that content that we have done on digital, maybe put a bit of that extension just on, on air. If you want to see the full video, hey, you can go to the digital and you can join us on the live streams and stuff like that. But the fundamentals, the topics, those all still remain. Um, right. And I think this is, to be fair, also to the announcers, and I always tell them this, you know, nobody expects you to be funny with every break. We don't expect comedians to be the same, right? Or, and, but why do we put our announcers to this standard? So even when we do air checks, they hate doing air checks with me because for them, they were like, oh, you know, we've done something wrong. No, you're not. Like, as long as you make an impact, you, you can, you know, if I'm driving to work and I've heard this and I take it and I, I resonate with it, then I know I've done my job. So I think it needs to be, you need to coexist, um, and it also needs to complement each other. Uh, but you're right, the fundamentals of radio still continues. Um, it's just which time belt that plays a role in it. And I'm just curious, uh, Megan, even you uh, too, and Priya, both of you, have you ever got resistance from pure radio presenters? Yeah. <laughs> To be on social media Ever. every day. Ever. <laughs> every day. Really radio presenters are introvert people, and mm. that's why they can sit in a room and talk to the mic without anyone being around. Mm. So they're essentially introvert people and social media talent. They're extroverts. So you're trying to make the introvert into an extrovert, and the resistance comes from there. How do you deal with that kind of a challenge? I'm the boss, I just tell them what to do. That's not <laughs> true. I'd love that to be true. Um, look, I think radio fundamentally is about connecting with people. You know, if you were sitting in that studio in front of a microphone, when I was doing announcing, when I was doing news reading, I would imagine my dad in the corner. Um, one of the, the news readers that I really admired taught me to talk to one person. So you're not talking to, to you know half a million people, you're talking to one person and you're telling them the story. And um, I always imagined my dad, and it's great because my dad has a bit hard of hearing and uh, if I talk too fast he can't hear me, so it was always a really good way to make me slow down when I was talking too fast. Um, social media is the same. Social media is about connecting people. It's just doing it through a different way. Um, I think we have hosts who are uh, 
old school journalists as well as old school radio people. So they're like, my personality doesn't matter. I should not be in the story at all. Please don't make me do it. Um, and what we've sort of talked to them about is essentially show them the data. Your audience wants to know who you are. They want to be able to see you. They want to imagine what you look like when you're sitting in the studio. They want to know what your dog's name is. You don't have to tell people your political opinion. That's not what this is about. It's about creating connection with those people that are listening to you and them feeling like they have a relationship with you. And that's really challenging for people, um, but it's the way we talk to our audiences. It's not always as successful, but we're getting there. For, for us, I think what we do is, uh, for example, if there's three people on, on the show, uh, one is a Gen Z who loves doing TikTok, the other two are millennials and, yeah. and Gen X who just don't give a shit, but it is still part of your job, right? We do five TikToks a day. So she will be with the phone and her pink hair and, and stuff like that and doing all of that, and the <laughs> other two will be like, cool, you do you. And then, and, but the thing is, that's how real things are, mm. you know? And the fact that even all of us, if let's say if I walk into the studio, I see the camera is on and I'm, oh, I guess I'm in a TikTok today, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I guess it's just walking the talk or, or more than yeah. anything, yeah. right? Like if it's, yes, it's out of our comfort zone, it's not something that we are used to, but if you want to continue to be in this game, you have to find a way to evolve yeah. or mm. get, get, be it a part is, of it. It's, yeah. It is the evolution. Now, we're one minute over, but I just want to ask Thomas one thing to do one thing for us because I think it's really important when you come to a session at Radio Days that you walk away with maybe one thing that you can do for your content creation or for your brand or whatever you're doing. And I want to ask you, Thomas, what, can, what one thing can everyone in this room do that means that they're... Uh, branding, their audio presence, everything like that. What, what can they do? Really simple, putting you totally on the oh. spot. We didn't discuss this beforehand. Oh, well, yeah, like audio, well, we all know it, right? Like, that was the reason why I went into radio. Uh, when I wanted to become a disc jockey, uh, or RJ, as to say in, in, in India, right? Uh, as a young kid, I, I fell in love with the magic of audio, of radio, the whole combination of music and sounds and voices and, and everything comes together and paints a painting or a movie in the head of the listener, you know, the theater of mind. Use that in anything you do on the radio. Use the power of audio in any way you can, be it in your sonic branding, but also in the way you tell stories on the air. Be relatable, paint a picture in people's minds, uh, be a good storyteller, uh, that matters. And that's, that's the difference between radio and Spotify or radio and visual media. Mm. Radio can do that like no one else. Someone said yesterday, I think it was the lady from India, um, radio is the first so was and is the first social medium. And I think that's very true. Let's use the power we have as radio and we'll continue to thrive for many more years. And I remember someone telling me once as well the difference between like TV and radio. Um, it, it will cost you uh, like thousands of pounds to get a, to make a cream cake the size of like a country, but you can make people imagine that in their heads with your words and your storytelling. Um, guys, you've been brilliant. I think you'll agree with me. Can we please give everyone a round of applause? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.